All right, hey team, how we doing? There's a stool. All right, same, same pattern as typical. So if uh, come come up and get this week's handouts. If you're watching online, we will uh, have those available to you. Should be just right next to the the. If you're watching on the website. If you're watching on YouTube, they're not there. So you'll have to go to fbcburney.org and pull up the video there to download the, the file if you're watching online. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Everyone good? We have any questions before we get started? No? Everyone's great? All right. Kind of well, quiet. Uh, Right there on the front T row. Tonight is going to be a, a perfect landing spot right before spring break. So we're going to do, uh, um, we're, we're going to cover, I'll reset here in a second. Uh, we're going to cover some, some of the festivals. Um, and then we're going to look at worship as a whole. But we're, we're going to tie in together a lot of the threads that we've already covered we're going to make a chart together, and then uh, and that'll be a perfect landing spot for spring break. And then, as you heard in, in Recharge, the first Wednesday on the other side of spring break during this time, everyone will be in here, not only our class, but some of the other classes, and we'll be walking through some, some evangelism training and how to use some of the tools that the church is, is passing out. And then we'll pick back up with our threads, and we'll continue through the... May the 10th, um, I think. The table of contents, okay? So Daniel's gonna open us up in prayer and then we will get started. All right, let's pray. Father, it is good to be together tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word. Uh, God, thank you for, uh, God, even the order, the design uh, in your hand that we see uh, weaving every single detail together so intricately and so beautifully to give us such an amazing picture of who you are uh, and, God, even how, uh, God, who you are and your story, God, how we fit into that. So, God, tonight as we learn, uh, God, would you just speak through your spirit to us and reveal truth from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Real quick recap in your minds. We, we've walked through the thread of Adam and we've seen uh, that Adam's a real important figure and, and that there's that repeated theme that runs throughout. Um, and then we looked at the temple and how, do you guys remember the movement of the temple from, from Eden to the tabernacle, to the temple, to Jesus, and then to, in the very end, the, the, the new heaven and earth as a temple. And then last week we looked at the priesthood and uh, the particulars of, of the, the priesthood. Now, when I say priesthood, your mind most naturally runs towards the Levitical priesthood and how they were, were intercessors. But we walked through and we, sh we showed how Adam was a priest and we even showed how Moses was a special type of, of priest, king, prophet because he was the initiator of the new covenant. And then we walked through some of, some of the priesthood. Um, the first half of this evening, we're going to look at uh, important Old Testament festivals, the feasts, and the way that those point to Jesus. So, so we're going we're gonna to cover four or five of them, uh, two of them in prominent detail, Passover and Yom Kippur. And then we'll kind of have wrapped up that section, and then we're gonna, we're gonna build a whole chart together, what I call of, of the story of worship, okay? So, with that precursor, let us begin by thinking about the importance of the Passover. And, and we're gonna look at it in its original context, but then how it became and why it became uh, a celebration, an annual celebration that needed to be celebrated every year. So you should hear some of the repeated language from themes that have built throughout. 
So here's our context. God's people, God's chosen people that he's given promises to are now in Egypt and they are being fruitful and multiplying. But they have come under elements of the curse. And in fact, they're even under an evil overlord that is the administer of this curse. Okay, so look at, look at this. This is how Exodus opens, Exodus chapter one. You can see there in verse seven, the sons of Israel were fruitful and greatly increasing. And then the little part I skipped out is, is, is then where they're saying, oh my gosh, uh, the, the Pharaoh's changed hands and now the next Pharaoh comes along and he doesn't know who they are. But that next Pharaoh comes along and sees them multiplying. So what do they do? They give them taskmasters and afflict them with hard labor. I'm highlighting language because a good reader, we've traced these threads. What does hard labor signal in your mind? Where did that originally come from? The fall. The fall, right? Hard labor. That was part of the curse. But even though they've been afflicted, verse 12, they multiplied more. So what did the Egyptians do? They gave them even more rigorous, hard labor. Now, as God calls Moses to go before Pharaoh, okay, as God's calling Moses in the very beginning, even before he goes to Pharaoh, uh, chapter four of Exodus ends with a summary statement. God is saying, hey, by the way, let me just tell you how this whole thing's gonna go. Here's what he does, listen to this. You're, you're gonna go to Pharaoh and you're gonna say, thus saith the Lord, Yahweh. Thus say with Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you have refused to let him go, so behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Do you recall in Adam's thread, we had a lot of Adam's called son and Israel is called son and firstborn. We're gonna see that and the importance of that tonight, okay? Set this up in this context. Okay, flip the page. Now, we're all probably pretty familiar with this idea of the 10th plague. So there's a succession of Moses going before Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. No. So a plague happens. It gets Pharaoh's attention. He begs Moses, hey, make it stop, make it go away. And so Moses prays, makes it stop. And then Pharaoh says, yeah, psych, I'm not gonna let you guys go anyways. And this continues and we get, we get 10 of them. Now, we've been told ahead of time, guess what? It's gonna take the 10th, right? That's, why, that's what I just read in Exodus 4. God said it from the very beginning. By the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to kill the firstborn. That's set up. All right, so now the 10th plague is in Exodus uh, 12 is where it actually comes, but the promise of it is in Exodus 11. So Moses said, thus saith the Lord, about midnight I'm going out into uh, the midst of Egypt. What I want you to know about I am going out, thus saith the Lord, who is the one who is coming in judgment? God. That's what he says. God's judgment is coming and he is going to kill every firstborn. So about midnight, God says, I am going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne and even to the firstborn of the slave girl who's behind the millstone, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Why is God doing this? But, but God's gonna do, uh, he's gonna make a separation of Israel. And this separation, this making holy, setting apart for holiness is what he does with Israel. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So now the details of the Passover. Some of you are probably pretty familiar with this. What were they to do? Each household was supposed to take one lamb. 
It was supposed to be an unblemished male, one year old. Did you know that they were supposed to keep it for four days and have a period of examination? That night, on the 14th of Nisan, they were to kill it at twilight. Then they were to take the blood and put it on the doorpost of their homes. They were to take the lamb, roast it by fire, and consume the entire thing. Okay? And anything that was left over, they were supposed to burn. But they were supposed to eat it with bitter herbs. Now, as they ate it that night, their loins were supposed to be girded. You guys remember what that phraseology means? Not one we commonly use. Okay, to gird your loins. If, <clears throat> if men wore dresses in those days, uh, just think long, flowy thing. If you gird your loins, you have, have taken them up in the middle and put it in the belt. The reason is now you're agile. You're ready to move. Okay? So they were to gird their loins. They were supposed to have sandals on their feet, their staff in their hand, and eat it in haste because this is the Lord's Passover. Look at the summary here. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, it's also at that point, the rest of Exodus 12, where we're told this is going to be an annual feast that you are to remember. You are to remember this Passover. Okay? It's incredible. You, you must celebrate it every year. And there are three feasts that we're going to look at that required a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And the Passover is one of them. Why? Why is the Passover so important? Okay. You, you are the A plus student and you've already jumped ahead in the cliff notes. We know it's, yes, it's pointing to Jesus. But why else? Why do you think the Passover is so important? Yeah, it's the first calling out, if you will, okay? It's, it's the first distinction. These are my people, and they are holy, and they are separate. He's going to take them out, and then he's going to unfold the covenant and everything that they are to do afterwards. So this initial saving, this initial setting apart is really important. In fact, it becomes the salvific uh, event of the entire Old Testament that gets repeated in, uh, well, in, in, in festival practice, and it gets referred to over and over and over again as the salvific event. It's the Exodus. I called you out. Remember when I called you out? And so we hear it all, at, all the time. Why? Because God is setting apart for himself a people for himself. That's key. That's very important. So, with that, let's draw on the board what we've just described. Because this whole class is on patterns, threads, even typologies. Okay? So, the Passover is a typology that points, as Sadie said, to Jesus. We're about to look at that in a second where the New Testament makes it very distinct that it's pointing to Jesus. But what are the important details as we start with the Old Testament picture that we want to draw on the board and then we'll point to Jesus? It's basically just the details that we started with there, all right? And that is that you and your family are supposed to take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, right? And you are to sacrifice that lamb. 
Okay? The lamb is slain. And then what are you to do? Her Take blood the blood. And the doorposts. Put it over the doorposts. Why are you supposed to do that? Yeah, you can holler out. Why? Yeah, you've got, you've got post here. See, the death angel is coming. Why is the death angel coming? Yeah, so we, we have not only firstborn, we are specifically told here, all right? This is God's judgment. God's judgment is coming. And you, and you must have a sacrificed lamb and the blood on the doorpost. And then what are you supposed to do? Eat it and then do what? Burn the rest and then do what? Get inside. Get inside. Okay? This is important in, in some typologies. Is there another typology of salvation where you're supposed to get inside the ark, right? That flood's coming. There's a giant ark with Noah. What are you supposed to do? Get inside. Did you know that Noah was, was to offer for others to get inside, but only the eight go inside? And here, what? Were they allowed to offer to others to get inside their home? Yes, they, they were. They, they were to offer to their Egyptian neighbors and they were to tell them and, and they were to offer, get inside. Is, is there another one that is like that that you can think of? He said, Noah, we've said here, what about Rahab? Rahab was supposed to put a, scar, a, a, a scarlet cord outside her home. Did she have the opportunity to tell others, get in here? Yeah, she sure did. She sure did. Get inside. Okay? And as death, God's judgment comes, will see the blood, you will be passed over. God will see the blood and will pass over, okay? Now, look at how the New Testament tells us that Jesus was our Passover lamb. One, it couldn't get any more plain or any more obvious than the fact that Jesus was killed during the Passover celebration, okay? He went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, okay? And what's, what's interesting in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, well, well, Jesus eats the Passover meal with his disciples, and that's the Passover. But then in John, Chapter 19, John actually places Christ's death at the Passover at the same time that they would kill the Passover lamb. And so when you wrestle with this discrepancy, you say, well, what was the actual time of the Passover? Theologians say, well, you have to understand that there would be so many people that came to Jerusalem that they would, they would offer and began to, to slaughter Passover lambs the day before, but then that there would be an official Passover. 
Well, look at John 19, 14. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. What's John trying to say? Well, I think there's a pretty obvious typological pattern here. And that is that Jesus is being presented as the king like the Passover lamb. Just in case you think we're too far off, Paul says it directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. For Christ is our Passover, okay? Also has been sacrificed. John 1, 29. Does anyone remember this context? John chapter 1. John the Baptist is, has been preaching along the shoreline. He looks up. Who does he see? He sees Jesus. And what does he cry out? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Another context, one of the great contexts of the entire uh, New Testament is in Revelation chapter 5. Mark went through it on Sunday. And that is in the midst of, of beautiful imagery that I don't have time to go into. John looks up, the, the call has who is worthy to come and to open the scroll and to break its seals? John looks up and he sees coming from within the throne itself a lamb as if slain. Now this picture and this pattern that we see here, that, that we've just walked through, this is what it looks like in the Old Testament. Now the New Testament says, hey, Jesus is our Passover, how is this pointing us to Jesus? What does that look like, sound like? Fill in those gaps. How is this picture and this movement like Jesus? That's right. There are particular times and movements of sacrifices that occurred. And the New Testament is, is, uh, points out specifically those, those times. And I think it's doing that intentionally to point to the sacrifices. But just, just help me out. You, you are having Bible study with your child. And you've walked through the Passover. And you say, hey, you know this points to Jesus, right? How, mommy? How, daddy, or grandma, grandpa? How does it point to Jesus? You say, oh, you got to give me more than that. <laughs> Start with this. <laughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we're separated from God. And the Bible says, in a sense, God's... The death angel is coming in the fact that we all are underneath the sentence of God's judgment. The death angel is coming for everyone but God who has a love and wants to call out a people for himself is great and rich in mercy. He has provided a lamb. By the way, who is unblemished because he was perfect. But he died and shed his blood. Did you know that a sword uh, was pierced into his side and his blood spilled out? So in that way, it's the reason the New Testament speaks about the blood of Jesus. It's the reason we sing about the blood of Jesus. Is it because we're morbid or we're just real fatalistic? We want to sing about the blood? Why, why is there this long history of singing about the blood of Jesus? Well, it's because of this, right? Because we know that God's judgment looks and sees the perfect, spotless sacrifice. And those who get in are saved. Right? Isn't that what the gospel sounds like? 
in a typological pattern of something that has been woven into the fabric of history and repeated celebration, a storyline that's told to you, you must do this and you must remember it. This is really important. You got to remember this. This is how it happened and this, why? Well, because 1,500 years later, a light bulb's supposed to go off whenever you see all that God weaves together. That's, that's the reason for all these patterns and repeated patterns. So when the light, so when you see the real thing, you're like, oh my goodness, he did that all along. We're looking for the Lamb of God. Okay, so real quickly we see Jesus was killed on the Passover, Nisan 14. He was raised on the first day of the week. The day of the first, first feast, by the way, uh, there's, there's a festival uh, for the first day of uh, first fruits on Nisan 16. That's the day that re- Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Holy Spirit descended upon the church on Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, the Feast of Weeks, celebrating the harvest celebration. Okay? All of that is done on purpose. In fact, the entire festival calendar is done on purpose. These feasts are for you. And they're fulfilled in Jesus. How does that make you feel when you know that Jesus was raised on the feast of first fruits? Because he's the first fruit from the dead. And that the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost. Because it's harvest time. Okay? Now with that, uh, Daniel's going to talk to us a little bit about, uh, many of you have probably come across a, a Seder meal and some of those practices because, because there was a feast that's required uh, every year. And even within Israel, they had developed particular uh, yeah, customs, um, yep. symbolisms that would go along as they would celebrate Passover uh, and they would do the Seder meal. So maybe you've seen one, maybe you've gotten to participate in one. Uh, but just like this, this typology with the lamb is so important and it points to Jesus, all of the different elements that were going to be on the plate at the Passover meal have incredible significance for the Israelites to remember their coming out of Egypt, God delivering them from slavery. And so they, they all have that meaning, and, and there's, there's incredible symbolism there. The meal itself would take over three hours to eat because it was scripted. There were, there were things that were said. It would start with a question that the youngest child got to ask the father uh, who was leading the meal, and the child would say, why is this night different from all of the other nights? And then the father would get to walk the child and the family through how God had called out his people, Israel, and how he had delivered them from Pharaoh. And he would trace this journey, and this would go on for 1,500 years. And at different times throughout the meal, there would be different things they would eat, Uh, There would be different cups that they would drink from, and each one reminded them of just a piece of this story. So some of them that that were probably most significant that we can cover just quickly, one, there would be a shank bone from the lamb on the plate. Now, what do you think that was for, to remember? The lamb that was slain, right? I mean, this is that picture of the Passover lamb that was significant on the plate. But then there was, there was this mixture of like apples and walnut and wine. It was called Heroseth. And this was a picture supposed to remind them of the mortar that they, it was made this paste. And it was to remind them of their labor in Egypt where they were having to make the bricks uh, for for Pharaoh. So that was on their plate. And they would remember that. And then uh, Pastor Jason mentioned um, the bitter herbs. It was typically horseradish. That was the most bitter, bitter herb that they had. And it was eaten so that they would actually cry during the meal to remember their slavery in in Egypt. Um, They would also take parsley. They would take some parsley and they would dip it in salt water and they would eat that parsley. Now think about a, a bunch of parsley together. What does it look like? Something we've already talked about that was used to apply the blood to the doorpost of the home. 
hyssop. And so the parsley, as they would eat this parsley, they were reminded right, that, that that blood had to be applied to the doorposts of, of their home and they had to get inside. So the parsley reminded them of this. And then the four cups each had a name and they were each attached to, a, to something God said in Exodus chapter six where he makes these statements where he says, I will do certain things. And, it's, and it reminds them of the whole thing. It's, it's the cup of sanctification. I will call you out. It's the cup of judgment. That would have been the second cup that they would drink. That God is holy and that God must judge sin. But then there is the cup of redemption that God poured out that cup. He, he redeemed his people, right? God, God called, he redeemed them through the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn with the blood that rescued them from the judgment. He redeemed them and called them out of slavery. And then the final cup that they would drink was the cup of praise, the cup of, of gathering that God was calling his people to himself. And so they would drink these throughout the meal. So each, each little piece of the Passover, uh, and then the, the final one was the unleavened bread. Uh, and even the bread had very special significance. One, it was unleavened, right? What does leaven represent in the Bible? It's, it's sin, right? So it was unleavened, just like the lamb was to be spotless and sinless. The bread was to be without leaven. The bread also would have marks on it from how they cooked it over the fire. So there were stripes on this unleavened bread. What would that have been a picture of? Pointing forward to. Yeah, the stripes. By his stripes we are healed. And then, partly because it made it cook faster, but they would pierce the bread. There would be holes in the unleavened bread. There were stripes and there were holes. What do you think the piercing of that unleavened bread? The nail mark. So even in this meal that for 1,500 years they ate every single year, there are these, these, these threads, right? This, this shouting to the Israelites that God was going to send the perfect lamb, right? To deliver uh, his people, not just from the Pharaoh in Egypt, right? But from the slavery of, of sin. Amen, amen. All right, I spent way too much time on that first one, so we're gonna move faster yeah, gonna on the second one. Get a uh, long-winded tonight. I do, all the time. I'm long-winded. All right, Yom Kippur, okay? The Day of Atonement. Uh, there, there, there are three festivals that you had to pilgrimage for, and then there is a fourth that is the most holy day of the Jewish calendar year. Uh, I, you, you can read, I have it all written out for you. I'm gonna tell you briefly uh, the important movements that had to take place on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and, and what that looked like so we can quickly see the way that uh, the author of Hebrews, as he writes, he pulls forward Yom Kippur language over and over and over again, okay? Uh, so God had set apart the Levites, but then he had set apart the high priest, um, and the high priest once a year and only once a year was allowed to go inside what is called the most holy or the holy of holies. Uh, Levi, could you show the picture of the tabernacle for us? Okay, so the, the actual temple portion is the tent there. The, the rest is courtyards that's around. And uh, it's important for you and your understanding to know that, that the, the sacrifice actually happened in the courtyard. That's where the altar is. But then uh, the, the priest would routinely uh, go inside the holy place, okay? And that's where they would keep showbread and incense and, and, and the, uh, the candles lit all the time. But only once a year were they allowed to go into the most holy place. Because in the holy of holies back there, by the way, a perfect cube, that is where God's presence was. The Shekinah glory of the Lord. Back there was the Ark of the Covenant with, uh, with two seraphim uh, surrounding it on either side. And that was God's throne room. And he was, he was to dwell above that. That was his seat here on earth. And so only once a year could the high priest go in there. And that was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. 
So Aaron, as the first high priest, would uh, he was supposed to come and he was supposed to completely wash himself and then he was supposed to put on his particular high priestly garments. Then the next major movement here is he was to take a bull and he was supposed to sacrifice that bull. And then uh, as the, the bull is slain, he's supposed to catch some of its blood, he's supposed to, uh, uh, and then take ashes from the altar and put that in an incense case. And then now he is ready to, to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, uh, this isn't in the scripture, but tradition says that they tied a rope around the high priest with some bells uh, just in case he made a mistake and was struck dead that they could pull him out. That way the next person didn't have to be struck dead. But as Aaron, the high priest, would, would enter into the Holy of Holies, he would first go in with incense. And the purpose there is he is creating a cloud of incense because God himself, the Shekinah glory, is in there. And he needs to create a barrier, okay, so that he is not struck dead from the Holy God. And so he would go in with the incense. And once there is a cloud of incense, he can now go in and he was supposed to seven times with his finger sprinkle blood on the side of the mercy seat. There's a particular spot that he was supposed to do. But he is going in the first time with the blood of a bull for himself. For himself and for his household. He cannot make the, the offering for the people yet. Okay, once he's done that, there would be two goats that you would cast lots over. One of those goats is going to be uh, sacrificed in the exact same procedure as the bull, but Aaron's going to go in there and sprinkle the blood seven times on the altar. This is for the sins of the people. And he also is supposed to sprinkle blood throughout even the holy place, the rest of the, the temple, cleansing the, the other utensils that are along the way. And at the conclusion of that, all right, and so he, he's done all that, but then with the second goat, that second goat, does anyone know what that goat is called? The scapegoat. What is he supposed to do with the scapegoat? He, he stands and he makes this, he puts both hands on the goat and he makes a declaration, okay, where, where he is placing the sins of the people on the goat and it carries the burden and then there is a person who stands in ready, once that has been declared, a person stands in ready and takes that goat outside the camp, in the wilderness, to be abandoned and to die as it carries. And that goat is cursed, okay, as it goes out into the wilderness. And then uh, with, with the, the bull and the first goat, they're, they're to take the fat and put it on the altar, and that is to be a soothing aroma to the Lord. And then the meat and the carcass are to be taken outside the camp and burned, okay? So that's the whole movement of Yom Kippur and, uh, and how sin is atoned for such that God's people can be declared clean. So now with that, we're gonna quickly move through and I want you to see all of this language, how we would say the New Testament picks up on everything I've just described and says, hey, it all points to Jesus, every single bit of it. That's right. So the author of Hebrews does this so well, all through Hebrews, right? The theme is Christ is better. 
Christ is superior. And so even here we see, and you'll see some passages here on page 63 where it's talking about Jesus is the true atonement, right? There is no longer a need for bulls and goats to atone for sin because Jesus has done that because he is the perfection that the perfect sacrifice that a holy God demanded. Right, this, that's why they had to do it every year because nothing would satisfy. But look at this language in Hebrews here in these four different chapters. Right, that there, that all of the all of the days of atonement leading up to Jesus' death, it says they were just a shadow of the things to come because they could never accomplish what mankind needed. But look, it says that Jesus was the one. Right, he was the one who m- makes it perfect for us to be able to draw near in Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 2, it says he's the one who will perfect. He is the author of salvation, right? He is the one for whom all things are and whom they were made. And he is the one who will bring a people to himself through his own sacrifice because he is the perfect sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 5, it says that we see Jesus being fully God and fully man man just highlighted here in this beautiful picture. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered and having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. Do you think there's a theme the writer of Hebrews wants us to pick up on who Jesus is and why he could be the perfect sacrifice that for that day of atonement to, to forgive the sins of all humanity. And then finally in Hebrews 7, it says, listen, for the law appoints men as high priests who are, what's that word? Weak. They were flawed, right? Everything about the whole system, right? They were, it was done by flawed men, right? We see that even in the first high priest in Aaron, right? Flawed, 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 everyone, flawed, flawed, flawed. But it says that Jesus was the son who was not flawed, right? Made perfect forever. So that is our Yom Kippur. That is our sacrifice for sin that the writer of Hebrews says, it's the better sacrifice. It's the perfect sacrifice. You say, but Jesus never entered the earthly temple. He didn't enter the temple in Jerusalem. Well, no. The scripture says he actually entered the heavenly temple. You you, you understand that when Moses went up on the mountain, he was allowed to see the real deal. And, and, And the tabernacle and the temple were just replicas. Why? Because it was long awaiting. In fact, everything that was taking place was long awaiting the replica Okay, because Jesus was going in going into the heavenly tabernacle. But but guess what? He didn't he didn't go in with with a bull's blood in order to enter in there first, right? He went in with his own blood. Okay? And that, that's what we see in both of these passages, that Jesus went into the heavenly temple and he went in with his own blood once and for all. So moving on to Hebrews 13, remember Pastor Jason just walked us through this idea of the scapegoat. We see the author of Hebrews pick up that imagery here and show us how this points to Christ. Uh, It says in verse 11, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin, where are they burned? Outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. Where did he suffer? Outside the camp. If you want to write these scriptures down, write down John chapter 19, verse 17. And Matthew 27, verse 32. Both of those in the account of Jesus being led to crucifixion. Both of those gospel writers said they led Jesus out. It's outside the city. Even that imagery that had been part of their celebration, right? their remembrance all through their history. Now Jesus, the perfect lamb, right? the perfect sacrifice, he is led out and he became the reproach for our sin. Amen? So, so unlike the earthly priests 
who, who had to go in with incense to keep from God striking them dead, who had to go in with, with the blood of bulls to, to atone for his own sins first. Jesus was completely different because he went in once for all time. Amen. And he is now seated. He doesn't go year after year. In fact, what's inherent in the system Having to go year after year, having to get another priest that comes after you because I'm going to die, so I need my sons to be able to do it and his sons to be able to do it because you keep having to go. All of that is supposed to point to the fact that the system is deficient because there is coming one who's going to come in once with his own blood and die for all time and make perfect for all time time and then to take his seat beside the heavenly father and the reason he's seated is because it's done it's finished he is resting take your seat as i make your enemies a footstool for your Amen. feet so what is the day of atonement then We've talked about this before. I think Pastor Jason has mentioned it. But in the Chronicles of Narnia, when you get to the last book and in that series, right, they realize that where they have been living is the shadow lands, is how C.S. Lewis puts it. It's just been a picture of the better thing that is to come. And that's what the author of Hebrews, this is where C.S. Lewis pulls that because it says, listen, in verse one of Hebrews 10, for the law, right, all of these, all of these things that point out the holiness of God and how man falls so short of the glory of God, we cannot live up to the standard of God's holiness and perfection. But this law, it has only been a shadow of the good things to come because it is actually impossible. It says in verse four, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins of mankind. But Jesus has come, right? He is the real thing. All of this, all of these celebrations, all of these feasts have just been a shadow pointing to when the real thing would step down. When John says that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, he dwelt among us so that he could be our lamb that would take away our sin. So as you look, we don't have time, but just a glance, and you can look at it later. Look at Isaiah 53, and I want you to see the language, okay? That same language of carrying the burden, I want you to think of the scapegoat, or of the slaughtered lamb, I want you to think of Passover. And I want you to see the way that that language has been woven in, even in the Old Testament, the anticipation of the coming Lamb of God. So we've talked about Passover. We hinted at uh, the, the, the Pentecost uh, briefly and even first fruits and Yom Kippur. Uh, Daniel's going to recap for us real quickly. Uh, we don't have time to, to do long, but the tabernacle was the third festival that required pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem. You don't have this in your notes, but he's just going to call attention to, to John chapter 6 and 7 because it's at the Feast of Tabernacles and the way that Jesus fulfills those. Yeah, so it's called Feast of Tabernacles. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the Feast of Booths, but it was for them to go out and remember living in the wilderness. And so during this time, there were two very important things that were done, right? There was this imagery, this picture with water that was done. That was to remind them of how God provided water for them as a people in the wilderness from the rock. And then how did God lead them? He led them in a cloud by day and a pillar of what by night? Fire, this great light. And so during the Feast of Tabernacles, there were these giant menorahs that were lit and they would burn for you could see it from miles and miles away to remind them of the, the light, that fire that led them. And so that was their reminder. But Jesus in John chapter six, he talks about two things. He says, I am the living water. And then he says, I am the light of the world, doesn't he? Right, it is during this time that Jesus says, even the Feast of Tabernacles points to me. I am those things. Amen. So just a quick, it's about as quick as I've ever explained that. Ever, ever. Give him a hand, yeah. 
When pastors so much more are short I wanted to and brief, say. it is an amazing thing. Uh, all right, so, so now think about this because, because I, I'm gonna wrap up this section, right? All of this is supposed to take place at the tabernacle because that's where God's presence is, okay? Um, the, everything at the, we've talked about major feasts, but there was a daily rhythm that occurred at the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was set up in particular ways, and there were, there were all sorts of instructions and, and uh, structure, not only to the tabernacle or the temple itself, but also with how God must be approached all the time. And so look at a couple of these, these statements, right? The reason it must be this way is because God is holy and we sin. And the only way that we can approach a holy God is on his terms and how he lays out. And as God has revealed himself, this statement was so good I needed to write it for you. Uncleanliness is a result from death and death results from sin. Sin brought death into the world, and contact with death makes unclean. For the holy God to dwell amongst the sinful people, the Levitical cult. Now, you're not used to that word, but the, the whole idea of, of cult in theological terms is this. You, you, you've got to, to kill, and you have blood sacrifice, and you have to wear this, and you have to do this, all of that. These are the instructions of how you must approach God. Okay, is necessary. And so we find in, in, in the laws, even of the tabernacle, and, and that is if you, if you touch death, if you are diseased, or if there is even blood, you are unclean. Why? Because all of it is a sign of death. Now, remember in our threads, where does that come from? <laughs> well, Adam, if, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. And death is instituted. And death is what separates us from God. And so you are declared unclean. And the only way you can come back, therefore, in the holy God's presence is through death. And it's why a lamb was sacrificed every morning and every evening. It's why there had to be uh, uh, incense taken from the altar. That had to be a soothing aroma that was to the Lord at all times in the holy place. All of these things were God's requirement because death separates. And you can see Leviticus 11, uh, 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement. So I, I want you to see that, that uncleanliness or separation from God can happen surrounding death, but I also want you to see that even in the tabernacle itself, God is creating a... Uh, a people for himself. When he called Israel out of Egypt, he called a people to himself. But there was structure that God put inside even Israel. As they camped and as the tabernacle, the tent of meeting moved, there was an order that everyone slept at night in the wilderness, and, and it began with Moses and Aaron and his sons. They were the, the closest on the inside. And then it was Le, uh, the Levites, the, the Levitical tribe. Uh, they camped next. And then it was the rest of the tribes of Israel. And they had particular spots that they camped. And they were all told to guard the tabernacle from any outside intruders. Because God is holy and he has called out separateness. But what I want you to see and understand is, is remember... God has called Israel as his firstborn. And even in that, I showed you a couple weeks ago how, how the Levites, as the priests, are called the firstborn. There's this exchange over the firstborn. And all of this separateness is happening um, because there is graded holiness. Now, why this is important is because God also called his people in his laws, in the Mosaic law, to 
separate based on holiness. And this, this is part of the dietary laws, okay? Separate that which is clean and unclean. And my people only eat what is clean. And, and when you wear clothes, you, you have to separate. Do, do not mix fiber. And when you plant your crops, you can't just mix them all up. You got to separate. And, and a lot of those laws and things that are commanded in the Mosaic law have to do with God separating and calling a particular people holy. And you can, Eli, will you pull up the temple uh, slide? I think you can see even what Jason's referring to here a little bit better. Look at all the different zones and the different areas in the temple that also are a reminder of this, this graded, this holiness. There were different places certain people could go and certain places other people couldn't. On the very edge of the screen to your right, you'll see, and I don't know if you can even read it, it says the Gentiles court. That, that's, the, that's the closest a Gentile could get to the Holy of Holies. And then it just moves in as you go with who could go where. It's, it's, it's picking up that same picture, that same imagery, it's that same message that God's sending even in the building of the permanent structure when they put the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that's a good picture of it there. So he's, he's calling out a people unto himself and then he calls out particular ones and then he says only this one is allowed to go into my presence. So all of that is separate and graded holiness, okay? All of that is the structure. All of this is God's revelation of himself and the importance of it in the Mosaic law and covenant, okay? Now, with that, we are ready for a, a summary chart. But you have to close your books. You have the chart completely filled out. Don't look. None of you cheaters. Close it. Close it, close it. You have the chart completely filled out. Which one do you want? Which but, side? Does it matter which one's which? No. Just spin it around. But in summary form or fashion, with our 15 minutes left, all of the threads that we have been covering, okay, I want you to see these major movements. Hopefully I have enough time. I want you to see the major movements of how the way worship was required in the Old Testament, the way that Jesus fulfills those and, and that the New Testament makes explicit that Jesus fulfills it, and then the way it changes the other side of Jesus, okay? So, all right, we, we've talked a lot tonight about the, uh, the tabernacle. Or the temple. And what made the temple or the tabernacle special? It was God's presence. That's what it's all about. We had an entire thread on the presence of God in Eden. And then God shows up in the tabernacle. That's where the Shekinah glory. And that's where you want to worship. And even this whole uh, graded holiness, right? It's like, I want to be close to God. Can man be close to God? Adam used to walk in the cool of the day. Now, God would show up at the tabernacle at this specific location. That was God's meeting house, okay? All right. Also, there was a specific location that was, was promised along the way that when you get into the land, I'm going to show you where you're going to put the tabernacle permanently, okay? And, and then that ultimately becomes the temple, which is where? Jerusalem, right? Mount Zion. So there's, there's God must be worshipped at the tabernacle. You got a pilgrimage there three times a year. And it has to be at this location. You must stop doing sacrifices anywhere else. You can only do them here and here, right? In Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Okay? Now, as you came, how did you have to, how could, how did you, uh, what did you have to come with if you were going to worship God? You had to come with a sacrifice, right? There were burn offerings, there were grain offerings, there were peace offerings, there were sin offerings, there were guilt offerings, right? And each one, there were different things you could bring. 
but a sacrifice. Yeah, and, and why did you have to come with a sacrifice? It's what we've covered today, right? Because of blood, sin and blood. It must, it must take place, all right? Um, and, and when you got to the temple, let's fast forward to the temple. When you got there and you had, uh, you, let's say you brought your sacrifice, okay? Who did you, could, could you just walk up and sacrifice it? No. You had to go through the priesthood. Okay, the, the priesthood is, is your mediator. He's the one that you have, he's the keeper of the entire holy place and he, he's the one who's going to initiate and, and walk along as you do all of that, okay? Now, we've, we've, talked, uh, we've talked a lot tonight about that there were particular times of the year that you were required to worship God, okay? You, you had requirements, okay? You, you had the Sabbath day, but you also had festivals. And three times a year, you must come to the temple in Jerusalem, okay? With your sacrifice through the priesthood, okay? On top of that, there were lots of things that could make you unclean. Okay, what are some of the things that we've talked about that can make you unclean? Yeah, coming in contact with death. Yeah. So, so any, any sort of, of death. Disease. It's terrible. Blood. Death, disease. Uh, blood is, is a sign, a symbol there of death as well. Um, makes you unclean. Were there other things that could make you unclean? Yeah, your, your sin and also your, your lack of separateness, not doing the things that make you separate. So you could eat things that make you unclean, okay? So I'm just gonna write here the separateness. Okay? If you don't separate with God's particular commands, you are now unclean. And if you became unclean, okay, do, do you know how you became clean again? Well, there were sacrifices and there were ritual washings and there was a process that you needed to go through because now at that point you have become unclean. You are not even fit to, to go and to participate in worship normally, right? You would like to do these things, but you can't because you become unclean. And so you have to go through particular washings and purification in order to become clean again, okay? And the, the, uh, one other part of your Old Testament worship that we haven't talked much about, but it's important to be on this chart here, is circumcision. What was circumcision? It's a sign of the covenant, right? Okay, it's the sign of the covenant, right? You needed that. You need the sign of the promise that you are one of God's people that you could even enter uh, even one of the courtyards, right? Okay, now, the New Testament would teach us repeatedly, over and over and over again, that Jesus is the fulfillment of every single one of these categories, okay? How does the New Testament teach us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple or the tabernacle? Okay, he's the presence of God. And where does the Bible specifically say that he is the temple or the tabernacle? John 1, 14. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. That word is used very intentionally. And then the very next chapter, John chapter 2, Jesus went and he overturned uh, all the tables in the temple. And you know what he said to them? Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it. Right? What was he saying? I'm the temple. 
Okay, so Jesus is the temple. He's the presence of God. I'm not going to do a very good job of filling this out because I'll run out of time. I've got to talk faster. Okay, and, and uh, later on in, in John chapter 4, uh, he meets a woman at the well, and he has a conversation with her because they're arguing over, uh, your people say you... You're talking all right. Okay, much better, yeah. All right, uh, your people say, uh, we, she says, your people say worship on this mountain uh, uh, or that mountain, and we worship on this mountain. And what does Jesus say in response to that? Hey, there's coming a time, and now is when that is no longer the case, but the Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. That location is going away. Okay? What's the next one you're blocking him? Oh, okay, Sorry. sacrifice. sacrifice. Sorry. We know Jesus is the sacrifice, right? We already talked about it. He's the Passover lamb. He's Yom Kippur. He goes in with his own blood. Okay? Priesthood. priesthood. What do we know about priesthood? Was Jesus a priest? Well, he was? That's confusing. What tribe was he? He's from the tribe of Judah. So how was Jesus a priest? In the order of Melchizedek, Ooh, right? The priest job. king united. We're going to come back to that again in a week when we look at, at kings. But we already touched on that on, on, on priests. He's a, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. A priest king combined. That's what the author of Hebrews begins to unfold for us. Yes. So he is the high priest. Okay. Uh, is he the fulfillment of the festivals? Well, didn't we talk about that? The Passover and Yom Kippur and, and the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles and some of those things. Okay, unclean. You know what's awesome about what happens in the New Testament? What happened when Jesus encountered the unclean? He made them clean. You know what happened if an unclean person touched me? I became unclean. You know what happened when the unclean touched Jesus? They got healed. They became clean. They became clean. Okay? That's what we see repeatedly. Like with the lepers, with the woman who's been hemorrhaging for so long, she touches Jesus. She becomes clean. Jesus can touch a dead body. You couldn't touch it. I couldn't. No. Jesus touches a dead body, raises it from the dead. Okay? All right. So he is what makes us clean, right? And, and Jesus is bringing a new covenant, a new covenant, right? So he's the author of a new covenant. And he, he gives us circumcision of the heart. Okay, now watch how these areas of worship, everything, this is what it looked like in the Old Testament. This is how you had to worship God. Why? Because God is holy and sin separates. And he has issued the Levitic cult on, it must be done this way through all these things. And then we've just seen how Jesus is the fulfillment of every single one of those categories. Now watch how those categories change on the other side of Jesus. Because where does the temple go? That's right. That's what happens at Pentecost. Where is the presence of God? Inside the believer, in the location, where, where do we worship? Anywhere that we are. Anywhere that we are. No longer in Jerusalem. He's no longer inside the Holy of Holies. The, the veil was torn in two. Signifying that, that he went into the heavenly temple and that it is finished. It is complete. And now the temple went away on purpose. Because Jesus was the fulfillment, and now we are the temple. And anywhere that we are, we are, can worship God. And the sacrifice is, is no longer on the altar in the temple. Jesus was the sacrifice. And then what happens to sacrifice on the other side? We become a living sacrifice. Isn't that what, what Romans 12 says? A living sacrifice with our whole lives. We give it up willingly, right? Because he has saved us. We now live as a sacrifice so that everything we do is worship unto him. What about the festivals? You forgot kingdom of priests. We find their fulfillment in Jesus. He's given us ordinances on the other side the Lord's Supper. But we find their fulfillment in Christ. 
And what can make us clean or unclean at this point? Yeah, so, so it's, it's not the do not taste, do not touch, do not eat, do not worship on a particular day or wear mixed fiber clothing or catfish or bacon is gonna make you unclean, right? Jesus is what makes you clean. And Jesus has made us clean. And you see this massive transference on the other side, okay? About what he considers uh, clean and unclean. And then ultimately circumcision. The New Testament says circumcision is, is neither one thing or another. It's circumcision of the heart. It's no longer the sign of the covenant. What's the sign of the covenant? Believer's baptism. That's the sign of your, that's the sign of your circumcised heart on the inside. All right, so, so think about this massive change in worship. Massive change because everything goes through Jesus. All of it pointing to the holiness of God and the way that God must be approached. And, and, and you can find all those laws and you can find it restricted. And I was separated, I was separated, I was separated. But now in Christ, we find freedom on the other side. We find that he has done it all. We find that we want and desire to be living sacrifices. But we are the living temple. And anywhere that we are gathered, we worship him. We worship him. The, the overflow of the priesthood of the believer and the way that we function now on the other side is completely, radically different. Because we are now a kingdom of priests. I skipped that one, sorry. We're a kingdom of priests. That's what the New Testament says. Isn't that magnificent? Wherever we are, Christ is. When we worship together, he inhabits the praises of his people. Wherever. Wherever. Us. Just us. Who am I that the presence of God would live in me? Now, a couple. So you have this whole chart filled out in much more detail than what we were able to write. All right. So you've got all the answers. But I want you to understand a couple technical things. Because this technical aspect hangs a lot of people up, okay? So I'm gonna give you, my time's up, but I'm gonna give you this really quick technical answer of the way the New Testament says we are on the other side. We would say we are, we are underneath a new covenant and the old covenant has disappeared. That's the entire argument of Hebrews eight and nine, okay? That the old covenant was a tutor until the new covenant came along. And there are changes that occur, and the reason is, is because of it went through Jesus, okay? That's the reason you can eat bacon and feel okay about it. I mean it, okay? This is a big deal. This bacon's great. That Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and to accomplish everything on on. That to have on the Mosaic law. Jesus was under the Mosaic law. You got to understand that. He accomplished all that was required under the Mosaic law. But then we see it on the other side different because he's fulfilled it. He's accomplished. So now listen to this. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Paul makes this incredible statement. For though I, I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. To the Jews I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. Those who are under the law as under the law, but let me tell you a secret. I'm not under the Mosaic law. But I become under the law so that I might win those. And to those who are without the law, I become as without the law. Though I'm not without a law. In fact, I'm under the law of Christ. I'm under the law of Christ. I'm still under a law, it's the law of Christ. Not the Mosaic law, I'm under the law of Christ. That's the technical aspect, okay? So that you understand the massive changes of worship, what it looked like, how it pointed to God, but it was ultimately pointing to Jesus. We've seen that in the Passover and Yom Kippur and the Feast of Tabernacles and all these things have been pointing to Jesus and now you and I live in the 
freedom on the other side. Not the freedom to do whatever we want and to, and to just sin and to go into licentiousness, but rather the freedom to be free from sin and to chase God with a changed heart, with passion, to be his presence, his hands, his feet, wherever. And our whole lives can be lived in worship to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray this. Daniel, pray us out. Father, we thank you tonight for this beautiful picture that we have seen. Thank you that you became the curse for us so that we could experience the freedom that we have gotten to see uh, from your word tonight. Uh, so God, I pray that we would not pick up uh, a yoke of slavery or of bondage, thinking there are things that we must do in order uh, to be able to approach you. But God, help us to be reminded tonight that everything needed to accomplish our salvation, our access to you uh, has been accomplished through the work of your son for us. Help us to uh, be thankful for that. Help us to live in the freedom of that and to live lives that glorify you as we worship you as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.